Every day I turn off onto an old country road. It's about a mile from the president's, but you can see them. And then you get up to them and you stand next to one and you go, man, these things are huge. How many people on earth can say they've got a collection of presidents in their backyard that you can see from space? <laughs> I oh, know, there's JFK. <laughs> I have 43 presidents and Ronald. These guys weigh approximately 14 to 21,000 pounds. These things are huge, aren't they? They've been here for about three years <laughs> and through time, they're starting to enjoy being out here. They've got their wildlife. Wow, got a bee's nest. The weeds are growing up, it's amazing. They amaze me. These statues were once a part of a outdoor park. When the original park had closed its doors, I was asked to destroy the presidents and clean the place up. It hit me, I said, I'm not destroying them. I'm gonna figure out something. The feeling I get from them it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, these guys, they still have strength today that they had when they were alive and forming our country. They mean a lot to me. I want to bring them back to a museum where they can be enjoyed by everybody. Here we are in the Ho Valley Rainforest. This is a cathedral, my cathedral. In this forest is the quietest place in the entire United States, and it's only one square inch in size. My mission is to keep it that way. I'm Gordon Hempton. I'm a sound tracker. I travel the globe in search of vanishing sounds, including the most endangered of all, which is simply silence. Noise pollution is nearly inescapable. The Ho Valley is the quietest, least noise polluted place in the entire lower 48. I don't know if I can save silence, but I know that I can try. So it was 12 years ago, 2005 Earth Day, that I hiked up the Ho River Valley. It took three miles just to escape the noise of the parking lot. That's when I was looking in every direction for which way I should go. I saw the elk trail love to follow their advice because they love quiet just like I do. And they led me right to the spot. It's just through that tree and then off into the woods. I defend this one square inch of silence by doing both quiet and noise monitoring. When a noise intrusion occurs, I locate the noise maker, send them a letter, and ask for compliance. This matter is urgent. Within 10 years, it's likely that there will be no quiet places left unless we take action. When I first started, I did not think silence would go extinct in my lifetime. And if that happens, the quiet will disappear and the wildlife will be devastated. The One Square Inch of Silence Foundation is pressing our politicians to pass a single piece of legislation that will designate Olympic National Park as the world's first quiet park off limits to aircraft. All things are possible. 
the earth is here and it's beautiful. And for me, it all starts here in the Ho Valley. Mi nombre es Renata Flores, tengo 16 años, soy cantante y estoy tratando de preservar el idioma quechua. El quechua es un idioma de nuestros antepasados, los incas, y también es nuestra cultura. Y este idioma ahora se está perdiendo en el Perú. La gente eh, lo ve el, al quechua como al símbolo de, de pobreza o de discriminación. Si se pierde el quechua, también estaría propenso de, a desaparecer del Perú. Yo comencé cantando canciones eh, modernas en quechua, mayormente para los jóvenes puedan escucharlo, puedan eh, gustarles ¿no? y aprender el quechua. Las canciones que hemos traducido en quechua eh, fue el de Michael Jackson, el de Alicia Keys. La canción de Michael Jackson, The Way You Make Me Feel, tuvo más de un millón de visitas. Y fue como que, ay, no lo puedo creer. Está viendo cambios eh, al, al modo de, de pensar en este, este idioma, de parte de los jóvenes. Me gustaría eh, enseñar a las personas y seguir con este proyecto del quechua. To be able to be doing science while you're out there on a surfboard, surfing down the face of a wave, it's just such a fleeting moment. It's incredible to actually be able to do it. Smart fin is a surfboard fin. You clip it on the bottom of your board, and you go out for your surf session. It has technology that measures ocean pH, salinity, ocean temperature, and very detailed wave characteristics. So there will be an enormous amount of data. The reason these parameters are important is because they are shifting directly as a result of climate change. We have detailed information about the deep ocean, but very limited, accurate information about the near shore. Satellites can't be really accurate with data in that narrow zone. And the other way is ocean buoys, and they're just not deployed at the coast. Bingo, SmartFin can fill that gap. Collecting oceanic data is a very time-consuming, expensive process. This is like, you just need to know how to surf. The data moves from your fin to your phone via Bluetooth, and then from your phone it goes up to our servers where everything's processed. I had to develop sensors that don't affect the surfboard. Nobody's going to surf a fin that is not a standard foil. Aside from that LED right there that's blinking that tells you that there's like some sort of technology in there, you wouldn't know the difference. So we've got a test tank set up now. And we're just trying to look at the precision and accuracy of the um, instrument itself. Things are looking pretty promising. As a scientist, it's pretty exciting to be able to get data over these different time and space scales. I mean, the fact that you can go out and surf and contribute to understanding what's actually happening out there is incredible. I'm not a surfer. I know nothing about surfing. I know I look like a surfer. But um, I'm not. Surfers are very influential and care deeply about the environment and want to be talking about it. So SmartFin is just a tool to do that in a more concrete way. I'm gonna win! No, you're not. Remember Finding Nemo, the movie that introduced us to clownfish? 
Love you, Dad. Dory, the absent-minded sidekick, now has her own movie. But marine conservationists, they're not excited. They're actually kind of worried. This right here is a blue tang, the real-life Dory. They only live on coral reefs in the South Pacific. But before we get to her story, let's talk about Nemo, the clownfish. When Finding Nemo came out, well, okay, I'll let Karen tell you. I'm Karen Burke de Silva. I'm a marine biologist and a conservation biologist here at Flinders University of South Australia. So what happened with Finding Nemo? After the release of Finding Nemo, we found that there was quite a big increase in the number of people that wanted a clownfish as a pet. With the increase in demand, it did have an increase in captive breeding, but it also meant that more fish were being taken from the wild. And in fact, some places there's been so much overcollecting that clownfish have gone locally extinct. Oh, so captive breeding seems like the way to go. Back to Dory, the blue tang. If her movie has the same effect as Nemo's, moviegoers are sure to want to buy a blue tang of their own. But there's a problem. And you are? My name is Matt DiMaggio. I'm a assistant professor at the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Ah, okay, Matt, so what's the problem? Clownfish are relatively easy to raise in captivity. But up until now, no one has raised blue tangs in captivity. Blue tang larvae are inherently uh, difficult to raise. They have a very small mouth uh, when they hatch out. Uh, so the food particles that we have to offer them uh, are much smaller and much more difficult to raise. The best success we've had to date is using a zooplankton uh, called a copepod. The copepods that we grow here uh, only eat live microalgae. So you now have to grow live microalgae to feed to the copepods. Basically, raising blue tanks so far is really, really hard, which means... 100% of blue tang are currently being taken from the wild for the aquarium trade. Most collectors in Australia will use uh, very careful collecting measures. In other parts of the world, Southeast Asia, they are using cyanide still to collect um, aquarium fish. Ugh, that's not good. But there's hope. Matt and his team are working hard to breed blue tang successfully. There's only one other tang species, the yellow tang, that's ever been raised in captivity before. Uh, and we're hoping that the blue tang will be the second. All right, so until they do, when little Johnny says he wants a dory, perhaps the better choice, for now at least, is to stick to the blue beta. Or a goldfish.